I hear a lot about the reward for innovation and it just seemed interesting to, to dig into it and see whether there, there is a reward for innovation or not. I'm sure many people in this room think there should be and Phil's already smiling because we've discussed it before. Um, and you know, there is actually a, a bit of a panel discussion on this tomorrow. So, um, you know, I'm happy to provoke some questions today and we can, we can pick them up with a couple of other experts tomorrow. Um, you know, should there be a reward for innovation and if there should, what does it look like? Okay, so it's quite a long presentation. You will get it in the pack. It's not unfortunately in the book, but you'll get it with the normal sticks when you, when you leave the conference. Um, it, it's kind of in these sections. It's not necessarily a, a, a run through this. I want to give a bit of introduction. I think other speakers have introduced the topic quite well, so I'll, I'll canter through that quite quickly. Most importantly, when we're thinking about product success, and I'm thinking here specifically in terms of health technology assessment, which is often our biggest barrier getting onto the market, what are the real drivers of success and failure? Looking at a couple of oncology examples and a couple of rare diseases examples. And I'm going to finish with a little bit of um, a couple of slides about winners and losers. Um, in other words, which companies are doing better than others? And before you get really excited and start phoning your lawyers, I'm not naming any companies. I'm just showing that some companies do indeed do better than others when it comes to HTA. Not because it fits with the topic of innovation, just because it's some analysis we really did, and I, I thought I'd like to share it with you. Um, and if you get bored, just let me know, and I'll, I'll shut up and go away and uh, quietly chair. So I think what we know and I don't need to go into this in great detail, is it's getting tougher. There's more HTA, there's more failures, it's a struggle. And at the same time, it's getting more complicated. So Phil gave us a really nice explanation this morning about the complexities of multiple stakeholders and all the, the, the challenges of engaging with all of those. Even if you look at a selection of HTA agencies around the world, they all want different things, they all prioritize different things, and they all do things differently. They make different types of decisions. As I'll mention in a minute, the impact of those decisions is differently understood. Now, we monitor about 100 different HTA agencies around the world. Some, of course, are more important than others. And in fact, this afternoon, I'm just going to focus on the main ones. I have a great desire to simplify things. It's, I'm often accused of oversimplifying and I think about that very carefully. And in my opinion, you cannot oversimplify. There's always a basic structure sitting behind every complexity. And in my mind, there are three basic things that drive a negative HTA recommendation. If you do a clinical trial, a faux pivotal trials, and you rely on that evidence for your HTA submissions, and you have poor results, there is nothing that anybody can do, not even one of Phil's <laughs> managed entry agreements. And that is something actually outside of your control to a large extent. Although if your phase two results were a bit weak, yeah, you, you have to ask why you went into an expensive phase three. And by poor results, uh, the sort of HTA feedback we get is a very small effect size. Uh, an effect that can't be meaningful to patients. It could be statistically significant, but still small. But if it's statistically insignificant, it can't drive any, any meaningful HDA. And what also sometimes people don't understand is the impact of uncertainty. So I bucket all that under poor results. Sometimes the price just isn't justified by the results that you've got. But the real focus of my presentation is the thing that you can control or at least somebody in your organization can control. And having worked in a pharma company, it wasn't always me. Um, sometimes the people who think they know the customers aren't the people who get any influence in clinical trials. And that, I think, probably is a subject of a different presentation. But if in your clinical trial design, you don't choose the right comparator, you don't have the population that the HTA agency thinks is important, you have the wrong endpoints, or just in some way the design of your trial is mismatched to the reality of the patient pathway, you will struggle to develop a good result. And to some extent, most of what I have to say now follows from that, that one of these three major buckets of failure. So I mentioned before that the impact of HTA is different depending on the country, and I think that's also worth bearing in mind. In many countries, the HTA process is, is the pathway to reimbursement, okay? If you get a positive HTA, you will be reimbursed. If you get an HTA with restrictions, you'll be reimbursed in a certain restricted population or under conditions. 
And if you get a poor HTA, you simply will be refused reimbursement. In some HTA processes, that leads to a negotiation or a dis decision around price. And in some, it leads to a decision around access. So when I think about access, I think particularly about the UK, where NICE and SMC don't actually make decisions around reimbursement or price, even though people think they do. They make decisions around access. I'm just looking straight, straight at our first speaker this morning to check that she agrees with me. Okay, she's not throwing anything. She might later when we have her in the panel discussion. So, so these are the, the impact of, 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 of the, the end point of the HTA decision. I think that's, uh, it's also worth bearing that in mind when, when we understand that they're not all the same. So what goes wrong? And this is all about the clinical development uh, process, the clinical development plan. I don't just mean the individual trial when I say clinical development plan. I mean the whole exercise you go through to build the evidence to get your products used and paid for, because that's really what it's about. Okay? Um, none of this will be a surprise to you, but it's extremely helpful when you split the assessment of a clinical plan into its component parts. So the first place it goes wrong is that the trial population doesn't reflect the population for which positive HDA or reimbursement is actually sought. And I still recall, because I've been around a long time, the very first NICE decision that was ever published. Um, it was, I think, for Relenza, and the manufacturer wanted reimbursement or positive HTA access for elderly patients. In fact, there was no elderly patients in their trial, and they were shocked and horrified, distraught, hurt, and upset to learn that NICE expected them to have gathered the evidence in the relevant population. And this was the first time somebody had thought that that was important. Okay. Sixteen years later... I would have thought that most pharma companies had learned from this, but sometimes we discover that they haven't. Okay. The other thing is that that population will be sliced and diced. So if you cover different uh, types, types of uh, patients, patients perhaps some of whom have concomitant risks or on concomitant medications, uh, HDA agencies will slice and dice, and the GBA loves this. You go in with what you think is one population and you'll come out with eight, each of which will have a different assessment. Um, and that delivers multiple complexity. I always think that if that's going to happen to you, you should be in control of it. You shouldn't let it happen. Okay. Um, this should be obvious. If your evidence is not against the standard of care in the major markets, you're going to struggle. And there is often a challenge with the standard of care in major markets because it's different. Okay. So in some markets, you'll discover, oh, well, this is a rare disease. There's no, no comparator. But something will be happening to those patients. There'll be some kind of supportive therapy, uh, whatever it is. I, we heard this morning, which I was, wrote down, that NICE will consider um, an off-label comparator in clinical trials. Not an unlicensed product, but a product that perhaps is widely used for a disease that it wasn't originally licensed for. And we see, particularly in CNS areas, um, products are, are brought to the market, say, for depression, and then they're used in neuropathic pain, they're used in, in other types of diseases. Um, pain, in pain particularly, there's a great mi mix and match approach. If you try to do that with a GBA, they will simply eliminate all the patient's on unlicensed medications from the data you present to them. And I've seen this happen. So there's you know, two agencies with, with, with contrasting views of the world. I can see I'm making it more complicated and more difficult. Um, so then when you try and design your trial perfectly for the HDA bodies, for the GBA, for example, because you've had a consultation, what you find is it's so different in structure from trials that have gone before, you're not adding to the, the known base of evidence. So you have difficulty in using other data that's been published to support what you have to say. And we spend a lot of our time uh, doing statistical indirect comparisons to, to, to help clients bridge a one trial to another. And I've got a quite important example of that later. Okay. And then sometimes you have trials with surrogate endpoints. And although you may fully believe that that surrogate endpoint um, is a marker for a clinical endpoint, sometimes the evidence of that isn't great. Okay. So I've just been reading... Um, a review of some of the uh, newer treatments for high LDL. And on the one hand, the report says in the introduction, it's been established that reducing LDL reduces cardiovascular disease. But when you dig into it, you find that actually that evidence is not as broad and as deep as people would like it to be, given the likely investment into the new products coming into this area. 
Um, people forget to measure the lack of impact on quality of life. Quality of life measures are not often a driver of value in terms of HTA. But when you have other evidence points, you know, increased efficacy, extended, uh, extended survival, particularly with extended survival, it's really important that the HTA, HTA agency understands that the quality of life is maintained through that extended survival. Otherwise, there's very little point in it. Okay. A big failure for HTA is the lack of maturity of data. If you're making a huge impact on patients, for example, in an oncology trial, you're extending overall survival by a significant amount. Your trial becomes longer because it takes a longer time to get to median overall survival. So we see trials uh, doing a, uh, an interim data collection at the end. This will have a lot of patients being followed up. And then you use statistical methods to project the comparison of median overall survival. And that creates uncertainty because it's extrapolation, it's not measurement. You got a question? Okay. And actually not really truly understanding, not collecting resource use data when you could have done. It's not so important to collect cost data because that is there anyway, but collecting resource use data is really important. And one of the things I'm going to come on to is the treatment is switched towards the end of the trial for cause because you see that the experimental arm, the patients are doing better. So you allow patients from the control arm to switch into the experimental arm and then you dilute your measurement of the treatment effect. It's a big challenge and a real one. I've got a little example of that. Okay, so taking all of that in mind, all of the things that can go wrong, and there are many, and I probably didn't cover them all, I've just got some, some, a little bit of data about um, HTA in oncology and a little bit about rare diseases. Okay, so it seems to be harder to get a good result in oncology than it does in some other diseases. So we looked at some oncology HTAs, it was actually 2013. Um, more than half had either a negative recommendation or some kind of restriction. And the comparable figure for cardiovascular disease was 36%. So there's a big difference in oncology. And it's a huge challenge um, for that reason, because I think companies investing in oncology clinical trials do so with the idea in mind that they're doing something really important, they're saving lives. And I'm not disagreeing <laughs> on that at all. Okay. So my first conclusion has to be is we didn't find that there was any innovation premium when we looked at the data. So this is a summary from single, technolo single technology assessments. It's in non-small cell lung cancer. It's between 2011 and 2014, so there's uh, four years of data there. And we took some of the major HTA agencies, Australia, Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Ireland, Sweden, and UK, because they'd done a lot of publication and they give a lot of detail. And what we found was that only in one or two reports was there any mention of the innovative nature of the product. Okay. So which I assume that innovation has to bring with it other benefits as well, which are measurable. And the primary one that HTA bodies ask for, it's no surprise, it's superiority versus the standard of care or best supportive care in the primary endpoint. That is the most, the biggest driver of a good result in oncology. And it shouldn't be a surprise. It's just sometimes it seems like it's a risky thing to put in the trial. Okay. The second one was the improvement in quality of life, which is important in oncology. Um, some of them would give a positive result with non-inferiority data in terms of efficacy. And that could be non-inferiority efficacy alongside improved quality of life. Ease of use, to me this is... Um, it's often used as a benefit. I have to guess that in these oncology indications, this was moving, for example, from an infusible to an oral, which is not just ease of use for the physician and, and the provider, but actually is a considerable benefit for the patient. They don't have to travel to a clinic or a facility and stay there half the day. They can actually take oral medication at home. Okay, Superiority in a secondary endpoint is much less valued than in a primary endpoint. Safety and tolerability is... Um, acceptable. But as you say, innovation hardly mentioned at all. Okay? So if, what your, if your argument for your product is that it's innovative and therefore we would expect a good decision from the agency, you really have to take that to the next stage and one beyond to say, what does this mean for the patients? How do I de design clinical trials to demonstrate this? I hope so far none of this is a surprise. 
Okay? Um, mentioned before, evidence in the right patient population. And so these are the, what I'd call the clinical negatives. So these are clinical aspects that have driven negative recommendations in HDA decisions, looking at the same group on the previous slide. And the single biggest one is the study population being different from the target treatment population. And you will get these slides and you can read this. And it mentions, of course, the inappropriate comparator. And, you know, clearly poor performance, like not meeting the primary endpoint, um, is, is, is fairly obvious. Okay. Economic negatives tend to be about the right comparator. So model assumptions not justified, the estimate of the treatment effect was questionable, the treatment costs were high. You know, modeling basically not strongly based on evidence is what they're saying here. And we pick this up from the, this is not interviews, by the way, this is picked up from the published HTA reports. Um, and they mention also that the treatment duration was, was wrong. Either follow-up was too short or the treatment duration wasn't actually what was, what was intended. Yeah. So looking specifically at the good tolerab tolerability data, there is a lot of data on this slide, for which I apologize. But what we're trying to map here is the, the safety pro profile versus the comparator and to say whether the, the decision was negative, neutral, or positive. Okay? So whether there was an impact on the HDA decision. Um, the interesting one is cabazitaxel, which went for resubmission with better data um, on safety and gained an improved AMSR in the second uh, review. But you can see that whilst we don't see this in necessarily very strongly in the actual reports that were negative, when you look at where the products are positioned in terms of the relative safety profile and the impact on the HDA decision, you do see that there is some, some effect. It is very clear in oncology that hard endpoints are the foundation of a good HDA result. So this is looking at all nice single technology assessments over a four-year period. So all in oncology, not, not a particular decision, but only one agency. And the plus minus says, was there a statistically significant result with respect to either overall survival progression and progression-free free survival? Okay. So where we have um, overall survival with statistically significant results and progression-free survival, more than half of the um, reviews were either recommended or restricted. Um, there were some reviews where we had overall survival with statistically significant data, but not for PFS. There were very few of these, and this was very evenly spread. Where we have um, good statistical data on progression-free survival, but not on overall survival, you can see that the proportion of the not recommended is very much higher, and the proportion of the recommended is much lower. Okay, and that there were very many more of HTAs on these products. So you, know, you would conclude from this that having statistically significant data in overall survival was a big driver of success. Yeah. Um, did you look at the comparators here, though? Because um, an active comparator in PFS is often considered, like, is often also driving, like, you could do this whole slide, throw in active comparator, and it would be a... a, a you could. I could have done 200 slides off this data set. Yeah. yeah. And so this is, this is really uh, just trying to make the point about overall survival. Okay. And this is what was recorded by, the, by NICE, in fact, in, in their um, report. It's always interesting to look at NICE submissions. I know it does different analyses than many other agencies, but they report in greater detail than almost any other agency. Yeah. You could be proud of that. It makes it very easy for people to understand what they want. And it, it, whenever people say, we don't really know what NICE wants, I'm amazed. I think, oh, maybe you can't read or can't use Google <laughs> because everything is published and it's very accurate. Okay. And overall survival actually can be very, very challenging because it is very often in trials that the patients are switched from the control group to the experimental group when you start to see an improved performance in the experimental group, which means that, means that your observed difference in overall survival between the experimental and control is reduced. Okay? I think the picture is, is quite clear. 
The explanation to have, as how to fix it is more complicated. Okay, so what typically happens is that when we see disease progression, patients can be switched then to the experimental group, which means that we're not properly measuring overall survival in the truly controlled conditions. Okay? And this is quite common in oncology trials. And it actually doesn't necessarily give you a problem in the HTA if you have a plan to fix it before you start. Okay? So the worst case is that you do it, and then you look at the data retrospectively and say, how do I fix this? Yeah. And there are two groups of methods for fixing it. And I should say that Andrew mentioned that I used to be a mathematician. And I say used to be because I did struggle through a degree in maths and have some mathematical ability, but I am not a biostatistician by any means. But there are two choices, really, for fixing this. One is um, simple methods where you either remove or censor the switched patients which kind of is like saying we shouldn't have had them in the trial in the first place. It's an extremely weak way of, of correcting the data. So there are some commonly used statistical methods, and I am not going to read these out to you. I shall leave you to absorb, absorb the slide. But what I would say is that if you are going to embark on an oncology trial and it's going to be the foundation for your HTA submission, do your statistical planning right up front so that you know exactly how you're going to deal with this issue when you um, make your submission. I would say also, in fact, I have a, a slide on this. Um, some agencies are pretty willing to accept these statistical methods, and we do still come across the attitude in Germany that if it isn't obvious, don't do statistics and don't do a model, okay? which I think is quite a challenge for, for these types of trials. So here we have a, a quite unusual condition where NICE approves a product, but the GBA don't and often it's the other way around. Okay, so let me, let me share with you one or two examples in rare diseases. Okay, um, although people talk a lot about rare diseases, um, actually there aren't, although and payers are concerned about the number of rare diseases, there are not a lot of HTAs on rare diseases when compared with other diseases. And when I talk here casually about rare diseases and orphan diseases, the data we've used here is for Europe. And the categorization was quite simple. If the drug itself had an orphan indication from EMA, then it was an orphan. And if it didn't, it wasn't. Okay? So we didn't apply any judgment to the products at all. We looked quite simply at the, what was published uh, by EMA. Um, and quite interestingly, although there's very many fewer, the distribution is not startlingly different between positives, negatives, um, no decision at all, and positive with restrictions. Um, it's, a, it's a relatively similar, although, you know, 20 times as many um, decisions outside of orphan. <laughs> this is a, a relatively new data set that I've produced, and we still have some more analysis to, to do on this, so watch this space. Yeah. I think the big place where we see the difference for orphans is the unmet need. This is mentioned by HTA bodies as being something which drives decision-making specifically for orphans, which is not surprising at all because it is part of the definition of an orphan condition. And you certainly see that in Germany, the rules imply that anything with an orphan designation, EMA, will be given at least the agreement that there is some clinical, uh, some relative benefit to the comparator even if that is unquantifiable, okay? But you see again, even for these products, only 1%, that is two, of these assessments mentioned innovation as being a driver. Sorry, 5% for the orphans and 1% in the rest. Is that, yes? A multitude of other things that we capture. Um, uh, so some of these will be... Uh, issues around the model design, some of them be issues around, around the cost effectiveness. Um, some agencies publish in great detail and maybe 20 comments they make about the, um, about the submission. And what we do is we categorize them so we can do this kind of analysis. If, if that's really important to you, I can, I can find the answer. Just kidding, that's fine. What's the definition that's being used for, so what, why are they categorized as innovative? Is it due to the MOA or it just says it's an innovative compound? It's, it's what they say in the report. And again, I, I can look back to some of these and see what they've actually said. 
Okay. And what, what we try and do is as we, as we bring the reports in, we have got some structure where we can categorize them so we can pull out analysis. It's not text analysis. It's analysis as the data is input into the system rather than the output. Okay. It doesn't surprise me to see few, men, few mentions of innovation um, because it should be a driver of other issues like clinical benefit or cost effectiveness or in, you know, it, reduction in side effects. It should deliver something that's measurable to the patient. I don't find many patients saying, give me something innovative. They're more likely to say, give me something that works. Give me something that isn't horrible to take. Give me something that doesn't inhibit my lifestyle too much so I can carry on um, doing the stuff I want to be well for. Okay. When we look at um, the rejection of orphans, mostly it's around the, the, the non-robustness, the uncertainties of the analysis, sometimes because the data is quite weak, the, the trials have no comparator. And actually, if I just go back to the previous slide, um, yeah, sorry, I, as I was looking at the data, what you could see, the different, one of the differences between orphan and non-orphan is the, the attitude to comparator. It is unlikely for an orphan to be rejected because of the wrong comparator, because that's again part of the definition of an orphan indication. Whereas for a more, uh, a more ordinary HTA, they often get a, a reduction in the benefit or a negative recommendation because the comparator is wrong. Okay. In fact, sorry, I, I see it here. Um, so again, what we see between orphans and others is it's much harder to estimate the treatment effect because, again, the comparator is not there. But what we see is in the non-orphan um, assessments, inappropriate comparator is quite a big driver of negatives where it's not mentioned at all for orphans. Um, and you know, things about, about the model, like the sources for model parameters, just doesn't come into it for orphans because they're less interested in the modeling and more interested in the basic um, treatment efficacy. Okay? Although they do sometimes quite question the actual modeling, um, but they don't question the sources. They think if you've got it, you've probably done quite well. Okay. And what's the most remarkable difference, I think, is between the countries. Each country has a different attitude to orphan assessments, and therefore what you see is a, a different range of uh, positives, positive with restriction, and negatives and other indication with a much higher rejection rate in France. And that could be because they do more assessments of orphans, and it's not corrected for that at this stage. And we hear things. So everything you've seen so far is based on analysis of data that's, that's basically published. It's, it's there. You can, um, you can see um, pretty much what every HDA agency in the world publishes. We do some of the hard work for you by pulling it into a database. Um, but also we talk to payers. Um, and what we're hearing is compassion and fatigue for orphans. Okay? So talking, for example, to people in Sweden and Scotland, first of all, diseases that are uh, categorized by EMA as orphan are often not what people expect. Okay? So they see diseases which are much lar larger than they expected as orphan diseases, and that's starting to concern people. I'm also hearing from many agencies that the num sheer number of rare diseases is becoming a problem in itself because it's okay if you have one or two orphan diseases. That's a relatively small budget impact. If you've been forced to assess you know, one every week, that's going to be a, a huge budget impact when everything is added together. And at, at the SMC, of course, they're willing to talk to patient groups and patient advisors, but they're seeing, we see so many of them that compassion fatigue quickly sets in. Yeah, they do care about the patients and their families, but it doesn't make, give them any more money. Okay? And the, the, nobody has solved the problem that there is, in most countries, particularly in Europe, no more money to spend. So it's about moving the money around. Okay? We can raise it in different ways. We can do different stuff. But actually, the most that a pharmaceutical co company can achieve is to do better than your competitor. Okay? You're not going to create any more money. Uh, that's probably why you come to conferences like this. <laughs> So, I'm chairing my own session here, you see. Um, I've got about five more minutes, I think, and uh, let me just take you through some very new analysis that we've done um, about different companies. Okay, and as I say, we're, we're very nice in quintiles. We're not going to publish the company names. We're not going to show you what your competitors are like. We're quite happy to sit down with individual companies and show you how you're doing. 
Okay, and we've done that once or twice. So what we did is we looked at a broad range of indications in a five-year period by some key agencies, and we used GBA, Haas, NICE, SMC, and the Netherlands Agency. Um, and it's original single drug assessment. So it's not second assessments. It's not multiple technology assessments. It's just the, um, just the single ones. And so um, if you look over on this side here and here, it's, it's a very strange room to present in. I've done this uh, year after year. It's probably our third or fourth year in this room. It's really difficult to see everybody. Um, but it's good that there are two screens. So on the left-hand side, what you see is the top line results when we add together. First of all, the entire industry is that middle bar on the left. Okay? It's about 800 assessments in the database. And that, tell, that gives you the standards. So we've kind of done the dotted lines across the screen. What we see is that the top 15 have a slightly lower percentage than the total of positives, but a slightly lower percentage of negatives. So they have far more restricted. Okay. But we see a huge variation across the companies, and they're arranged basically in descending order of negatives. So the, the top company is the company that out of the whole database had one negative and five restricteds. Okay. And then when we get down to the um, bottom company, that is num co company 15. So that the 15 companies are not the best companies, they're top 15 by sales. And then uh, the rest. And we're seeing whether the bigger companies perform better than the others. Um, and what you see is, a, is a, an increasing number of negatives. Now, there's lots of sub-analysis we could do here. For example, as a company in here had one product that had a pile of negatives. Okay, so one product really influenced the performance of the company. But there's other companies where there's a good mix of products, and we're not really drawing any conclusions. We're not saying, you know, you did this wrong, you did that wrong. But we took it to one of our customers, and they were fascinated to see where they sat in this 15. And then they could look away and say, well, actually, let's see what our competitors are doing that we could do better. Okay. It also varied. Um, by therapy area. So we, we've taken a random company here, and I'm going to let you know, I don't know which company this is. Okay, so it's, it's much better sometimes that the person presenting doesn't know anything about, just in case they say something which, you know, is meaningful. Um, so we see here that some companies are doing very better in some therapy areas than the industry as a whole, and are doing worse. A so company A in, in therapy area five, um, it's got a slightly higher proportion of positives, but in therapy area four, a much lower proportion of positives. Yeah. And some of that is about where the focus of the, of the companies are. And it's amazing that even with a, you know, a full data set of, of companies, we're getting down to quite small numbers when we do this granularity. So the next stage of the analysis is to expand the number of agencies that we include. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's, it's quite a lot of, uh, lot of analysis. And then we see how different, and this is a different company, just to, to make sure that we're not pointing the finger at anybody, a different company. I don't even know where they are in that, that number 15. Some companies do really well in some countries and really badly in others. So company B, you know, doing really well in France and the Netherlands, proportionately to the others, but relatively poorly with NICE, although quite well with SMC. And again, all we're doing is comparing these to the industry, not to any external benchmark. And it's a number of positives. It isn't any judgment on our part. Did they do a nice submission? Right? Did, they, did they do a good model? Our view is if we did it, they did a great one. <laughs> and if we didn't, we don't know. Um, but it's just, just comparing the, the, the data uh, amongst the companies. Um, where did these data come from? It came from here. Uh, it's HC Accelerator. Um, we combine multiple data sources, including the, the EMA data, which allows us to pick up the, the orphans and other things. Um, and there's about 18,000 records in there, HDA re um, records worldwide. Okay. Can you do anything? Well, it's exactly what Phil said this morning with respect to managed entry agreements. You do your research up front. Um, a lot of people jump into market research. They do ad boards and they do interviews. My view would say there's so much published in this area. Um, I'm looking at our friends in context matters. I'm sure they'd say exactly the same. Look at the published data first. 
Okay? Don't go and ask questions if you can find the information published. Use what agencies have done before to form really smart questions. Okay? Then you'll find out more. And you can actually have formal consultation with most of these bodies. You can do parallel scientific advice with, with EMA and HTA bodies, or you can do individual consultation. And I would say if you're going into formal consultation, do your market research anyway. So to me, this is a stepwise process. You always start with the secondary before you head for formal consultation. I'm sorry, I don't know quite why it's doing that. And this should be the easiest thing for companies. You know, collaboration internally is usually the best way for success. It has always been the case from the very first work I did in health economics, which was a scarily long time ago, companies that were joined up did better because they were more prepared. The clinical trial design took a lot of the payer needs into account. Companies that, that don't have the ability to be joined up don't do so well. And it's easy to say that, and I've been to a thousand conferences where people have said it, and this is a kind of simplified view of what collaboration looks like, and it's not simple. Okay? It involves multiple people with multiple jobs, speaking to multiple other people, with different training, using different language, based in different countries, working to different time scales, and pulling all that information together. It's hugely challenging. But nonetheless, I think you should try. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? I think you should just let him keep a mic, have one of his own. No, no. I, 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 can you go back to the top 15 um, slide? Because that's yeah. a really interesting analysis. And do you, if you look at the, the difference of this one, if you, have you done any deep dive into why certain companies have higher HTA success rates? Okay. Now, that is a really good question, and I wish I'd planted it with you, but I didn't. Um, it's, it's, no, Janice, you didn't. <laughs> but I'll buy you a drink she, later. She didn't. <laughs> um, it's a really good question, and it's a question of strategy. What we actually find is that companies go to HDA actually with a different strategy. So looking at it like this, you might assume that everybody's focus was getting the most positive HDA as quickly as possible. It's not the case. So I'll give you the example of a, a couple of years ago, we were working for two companies. We were doing nice submission for each company. One was quite a big company. One was quite a small company. They both had new products that we'd been working on, and we've been doing not just their UK submissions, we've been doing other work. The one company, their instructions as we went, as we prepared the NICE submission and we went into the assessment meeting was, we will not give anything on price. Okay? The price is the price. There will be no pass. There will be no discussion. There will be no negotiation. We need a positive NICE with the price intact. And we did try and persuade them this might not be the best strategy for them. But they'd spent years and years and years developing their plan. They'd locked their prices down very early in the process before we were involved. So we said, okay, but that may mean a reduced target patient population. And they said, that's absolutely fine. That's what we want. And we got them that positive. It took a long time. It took multiple iterations. We modeled and we modeled and we modeled. So we were down to a group of patients that we could have known personally by name, but they got their positive and they were happy and they marketed the product. At the same time, working for another company, their message was, we're second to market in this therapy area. We cannot afford to lose any time. Price should never be a barrier to the success of this product because the market is competitive. We want the quickest, smoothest, easiest, most glowing recommendation we can get from NICE to speed us into the market. Are you sure you don't want to argue through a pass? Are you sure you don't want to work on price? No. Speed is our strategy. And that's what we got them. So when we look at success, we're measuring positives with an assumption that that's what the company wants. But it might not be the right assumption. It might be that they cannot give on price because there's pressures from other markets. It might be that there's other things that, that, that are a barrier that we don't know about when we look at the database. All you can hope is that you can build a, a data set like this to a big enough number where some of those things balance themselves out. Okay? But it's a really, really great question. Thank you. Any more? I'm, I'm chairing my own session here. It's really quite good. I could have gone on the whole afternoon. Yeah. One, one, one part is this is the, the HTA decision, but then um, are you able then to follow through to see whether or not 
Because in a lot of cases, this is separate from the reimbursement decision, whether yes. it's the drugs are actually ever reimbursed and the companies were able to successfully commercialize the products, and that's not always reflected in the HTA decision. And so the question is, does the database then take that next step to say, okay, so where did it matter, where didn't it matter? Uh, another really good question. So where we're building to is the price. So we, we, for, for some of the bigger countries, we're now collecting the price data. So if there's a price approved and it's in the reimbursement system published, we can then lock down reimbursement and price. What's much harder to do, unless you're IMS, is to say, what did that mean in terms of product uptake? Because that's, that's the part of the data we don't have. Because in a lot of markets, you can have a great price, but it doesn't really matter. You can have a great price in almost any market. Without any sales. And, and certainly when I worked in a pharma company, my attitude was always our strategy is revenue maximization in the territory. So our focus was, was, was EMEA, like, like, like many regional head offices. And so I wanted reg revenue maximization in the region for which we were responsible. And that had a time factor as well as a price factor as well as a volume factor. Yeah. So we, we, might, we might delay a couple of years to get a really different price in France, but we weren't going to argue over a few pennies if it got us to market six months quicker. Yeah. Different companies take different strategies. Nothing is right or wrong. It depends what your portfolio looks like and what your pipeline looks like and, and you know, what else you're trying to do. I have a little sense that some companies are a little bit political sometimes about HTA. They would rather have a negative than give on price because it allows them to say publicly what nasty people nice are or what nasty people the GBA are. Um, and, you know, we can't pick up anything like that. We're just picking up what the decisions were. And, of course, if we talk individually to companies, they can take their own view about what their strategy was.